Hi, Howard, and welcome back for a, another episode. Um, it's been you know, the feedback that we've had over the past over the past couple of months has been has been superb. And, oh, great! You know, that, and, that's great. And I'm really I'm really grateful that you could join us today to talk about something that's that's certainly close to to my heart, but also I know um, I, I know yourself as well. Relapse prevention. Um, sure. Terms, no, I think it's an it's, important topic. Yeah, and and I find it's one of these topics that, um, that that is bandied about so much in in recovery. Okay, so um, just to, you know, and it's almost like it's almost sometimes they're almost off the cuff um, conversations. So there'll be a, a a meeting, say it's a twelve step meeting or whatever, and someone will say, oh, you know, to the to the, the newcomer, oh, you know. Be sure to work on your relapse prevention. And then the guys and they don't know start. what they're talking about. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, the people who say it and the people who are receiving that same message are, are totally in the dark as to what, what relapse prevention actually means. And I know throughout um, throughout treatment and in different different treatment centers, there'll be an element of of psychoeducation, right? An element of of relapse prevention. But really I think it's and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's like trigger prevention, okay? So relapse, relapse caused by something. And so is that something that you would agree with? And, and if so, what would you say were the kind of common triggers that, that people are going to experience? Well, let me qualify it first. I, yes, I think it's a very common thing. Unfortunately, we know that the recidivism rate of going back to uh, rehab is really high. So... The idea when people come to me and say, you know, hey, Dr. G, how can you help me with relapse prevention? What's the plan? And I go, I don't know yet because I don't know you because addiction is very complex. We know that many elements go into it. So for each person, the plan for relapse prevention might be a little bit different. But having said that, Alex, there's still some fundamental issues, and it's usually at least from my perspective, again, I'm coming at it as a psychologist. From my perspective, there's a lot of underlining issues that may come at play that may cause somebody to relapse. So I jotted a few things down, like identifying your triggers. You know, everybody has different triggers, things that set them off. And a lot of times, you you know, you don't know what those triggers are going to be until they start. They basically set you off. It could be a fight with a spouse, a disagreement with a parent, your boss. Um, you know, you could be walking down the street and there's a bar that you're walking by and suddenly you look in it and go, something triggers you to want to go back inside. So I think it's very important, Alex, for everybody to get a sense of what are the triggers? What might cause you to relapse. Um, like I know for myself, one of the things I struggled a lot with at one period of my life was stopping smoking. And that was a time when everybody smoked. And I would tell my friends, if you come to my place, you can't smoke inside. This is when it was fashionable to smoke inside. And it was mostly because I didn't trust myself. I knew that given the right circumstances, I could easily relapse. So for me, that was a big trigger that I had to be very careful about a past experience because honestly I actually really liked smoking even though it was killing me but I still liked smoking like if they could figure out a way to make it safe which they can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would probably still be smoking but you know that was a different time and place yeah. so I'm going to actually turn the tables a little bit Alex and ask you what's your opinion what's your trigger I find um Interestingly enough, I find I, I get a real physical um, response to um, to different environments and, and music. Okay, that's a that's a that's a big one for me. That's so, a big one. okay, pro so probably probably showing my probably showing my age a little bit um, in terms in terms of the type of music that we're talking about. But um, you know, certainly certainly the kind of certainly the kind of house scene. Um, right, and, that you used so, to have on your eight tracks, right, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, um, <laughs> no one's. Yeah, gonna, and, there's a group of people <laughs> that are going to have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> and and interestingly, some of some tracks, and sometimes it's something that I haven't heard. It could be something that I haven't heard for for years, right? 
it could be like 20 years or so. And I'll be driving and I can, I, can, I hear it and I, I feel it. I feel a tingle in the back of my, in the back Absolutely. of my head. Absolutely. It's a visceral it goes, response. And it goes, and it goes right down, right down my body. And I look at my arms and I see um, what can only be described as goosebumps down my arms. And then as the music kind of carries on, just as about to, just as it's about to go into the drop, I get my hair just literally stands up on, on end right across my body, which is like, and it's that, it's that, it's like a euphoric. And I keep, well, I'm like, right, you know, when I read the word euphoric recall, I'm like, I know exactly what that is. And it kind of takes me back, but it takes me back in a, in such a, in such a beautiful way. Right, it takes me back to a place of to a place of oneness, a place of like feeling just fantastic and free and liberated. <laughs> takes you back to the nineteen sixties, right? It's, it's complete bullshit. Because, uh, well, the first but that's actually a very important point. To quickly ask, that's what people remember is the positive part of it. You know mm. that euphoria at the beginning. You do a certain drug. You do a little coke. It's very euphoric, empowering. Yeah. But then what happens? That doesn't last very long. Yeah. It's complete. It's, it feels like it's a complete trick because everything in my brain is going. This is what you need. This is what you love. This is this is you, right? It's like physiological. It's like this is this is who you are. This is your being, you know. But it's not. It's a complete. It's a complete scam. Um, so that's so, the yeah. devil talking to you. <laughs> very much so. Very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. So and the devil can um, to use that term can be very convincing. Yeah. But you know, it's an it's old so tape. So I think the best thing to do, everybody experiences that out. I think the best yeah. thing to do is just let it run and not pay yeah. too much attention, not act out on it. Mm. And and it's um yeah. it's quite and this is sounds this is this is um it's I don't know if this I don't know where this comes from sometimes, but it, it's actually quite sometimes it's quite enjoyable. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's an enjoyable feeling. And um it's also enjoyable to recognize it for what it is and go. Christ, you know, if 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 I didn't have the coping strategies around, if I hadn't had, you know, a, a, a decent amount of sobriety, then I'm going to be really struggling with that feeling if it comes up in a different environment. So, as you say, if I'm in someone's home, or if I'm in a if I'm in a coffee shop, or walking past a bar, or a social function, and that kind of response comes on, then um, then it I know it's it's a very dangerous place to be. So, I think. It's interesting that everybody talks. I think relapse prevention is such a, you know, such a. It's complex. Work. You know, you've got to think of it like a puzzle that you're putting together and individualized for yourself. And are we really talking about coping strategies, or or therapeutic intervention, or or a, a mixture or a combination of them both? I think it's a mixture of combination of both. Like you said. Well, one coping st strategy is to be able to be mindful of your thought process. So if you have that thought process where the old tape is running, it'll be so much fun, I'll get high, I'll do all this stuff, uh, I'll get euphoric, to recognize that that's an old tape and that you shouldn't pay attention to it and just let it run its course, you know, like the old uh, VCR tapes, you know, that would just run <laughs> when they got caught. Yeah. Uh, that is a coping strategy to not listen to those voices and listen to the more powerful voices that tell you, you know, this is not something you should be doing. So I joke around. Yeah, it's kind of like having the devil on your shoulder telling you, come on, Alex, you can do it. You can do it. It'll be a lot yeah. of fun. But if you have that mindfulness to know that's not the truth, you can allow it to play out. Another important thing, a coping strategy is. I think is just be honest with yourself. If you're at a party and there's too many triggers or it's too much, go take a time out, take a break, go walk around the block, go somewhere else. If you want, come back to the party. If you come back again and you're experiencing the same experience, I think you should probably leave and just explain yeah. to the host or hostess what your situation is and chances are they'll understand but mm. it's about being really honest where you're at in life mm. to me that's very important um there's and, a ton of these but go ahead no no i was, I was gonna say it and um there was something that i read that you've um that you wrote in a, an article um recently uh, right history, was was about um as well as the coping strategies was about looking at unresolved unresolved trauma from the, from the past and 
you know, and how, you know, going into, going into, going into treatment for 30, 60 or 90 days is very un unlikely to um, uncover and heal or, or, or start to heal uh, any of that unresolved, um, on a, any of those unresolved issues. So I think that's something that you're, you're, that you, you work with, with, with clients as well. Isn't it? Yeah, you know, I, one of my frustrations with a lot of treatment centers, and it's not necessarily the treatment center, well, maybe it is, it's the way it's presented, that somehow you're going to go into a program, like you said, 30, 60, 90 days, and you're going to be able to be healed of your trauma or uh, healed of your addiction. And I feel that's misleading because the truth is it's something you're going to work with the rest of your life. It's going to come back into your life. And, but what is the value of a treatment center is it allows you to, you know, put the world to the side and really focus and get a strong foundation, but not, I think it's a mistake to believe that the work is done when you leave the facility. I tell that to my clients and dare not, we do in-home treatment. And I always say, I'm here to help you get started. I, I, I don't promise to heal of anything because that's not what mental health is really about. Mental health is about getting the insight, the strength, the ego strength to be able to deal with your issues as they come to you. Because, you know, you're going to get anxious the rest of your life. You're going to get depressed at times the rest of your life. You're going to get frustrated. How you manage it is going to make a big difference. If you resort to substances, uh, addictions, uh, you know, behavioral addictions, you know, that that's not going to resolve anything. So it's a great jumping point, um, you know, starting point. But honestly, there's no healing in mental health. There's... I always think of it as you get stronger and stronger to have more and more free will. What I meant by healing is, I want to qualify that, there's no getting over it and it's completely gone. <laughs> That's why people go to meetings the rest of their whole lives, because they understand the support system is so important. Because you don't know where those triggers are going to be. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think... Um... You know, Doctor Doctor G. You know, I, I'm always it's always it's always lovely <laughs> speaking with you. You're, you're so you're you're so knowledgeable, but also um, very very humble. And and I think what what lots of listeners maybe maybe don't realize is that you're actually one of the most um, experienced and highly regarded addiction Thank specialists you. in the world. Um, and with that with that in mind, if you were to if you were were, you were speaking to somebody um, at a party very very quickly or a quick kind of synopsis, what would you say your your top um coping skill top structure top the no, top relapse prevention skills would actually would actually be um if you had to give like the top top five rundown what would you what would sure you well i would say like we said you know the knowing what your triggers are being very being very honest with yourself about who the the trigger people are toxic people toxic situations especially if you're newly sober that's one of the things that, you know, people come out of rehab and they think they know it all. I go, you know, you don't know anything. You know, and you, you know, you said to me, you're humble because you know what, Alex, my struggle isn't different than anyone else's struggle. I may have been doing this a long time, but that doesn't mean I don't have my own issues or my own struggles, et cetera. And it's important for people to look, to know that because I found a lot of people look at mental health professionals and think, oh, they have it all figured out. I always say, you know, I'm not the poster child for mental health that you think I am. <laughs> I've got stuff too. And that's actually very reassuring for people to know that there's a partnership I'm trying to form with someone. And to me, that's the best type of therapy. Um, so finding support, Alex, is really important. Um Finding a once you get sober and you have some of it under your belt and you feel like you know you're a little stronger, I think it's so important to try to find something that will give you meaning and passion in your life, whether it's you know being a parent, a grandparent, a career, whatever it is, but it's got to be your choice. It's got to be something that feels organic 
because a lot of times, you know, people use because they're bored or they're frustrated and they, you know, they feel they're in jobs or in relationships that have very little meaning to them. So being able to discover what's that passion, and that's a process. It's not like, Alex, you know, you open up a book and say, oh, I wonder what my passion is today. If you're sober enough and you start doing, let's say, the steps or treatment or therapy, your passion will come. Uh, you'll get cognizant of what it is. And a lot of times that will frighten you. Because, you, you know, I have a client and he always said, oh, come on, Dr. Glass, that's just a dream. I go, yeah, it is a dream. And people make dreams into reality. And there's a hundred steps you're going to have to go through and hurdles to overcome. But let's go after that dream. Because if that's going to make you happy, chances are, hopefully, you're not going to want to ruin your life by, um, you know, by using. It's like something becomes more important. You get bored with the old lifestyle. So finding a passion, focus on what makes you happy. Again, Alex, we know people will say to me, well, I can't be happy. I have to make a living. So, but what about if you could do both? Yeah. Chances are you'll make a better living because you'll want to go to work. You'll want to do the extra time, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I, and I, I know the real world has demands and relationships and kids have demands, but if you could find a way to be happy in what you do, and it doesn't mean you're walking around smiling all the time, but you have a sense, I'm in the right place. This is what I should be doing. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it feels right because we've all been in jobs that we dread going into, and that's the worst feeling. And um, like you said, dealing with unresolved trauma. Trauma is really difficult to deal with because it sneaks up on you and you don't always know it's there. And especially if you've had some major trauma, something that goes back to triggers, Alex, something that's going on in the present may, tr may trigger a trauma. And then you're going to have a flood of emotions and, um, you know, terror and anxiety that's going to feel so much greater than what the situation is calling for. And that's a lot of times people choose to use because they go and, you know, they want to use, they want to calm down, basically. They self-medicate. So find a good therapist. Uh, there's a lot of people, a good coach, whatever's going to work for you and try to get as much distance from that trauma as possible. And then when it's happening, to have the coping skills to know how to deal with it and not act out on what's going on. And for, for me, one of the really one of the really interesting sure. things that you mentioned was um was I try and summarize it in the in the in the right way. Some um, living living life according to your highest values. And and I think you know the work comes with identifying and uncovering what those values are, because sometimes they're not what you initially think. And you know, you've Absolutely. got the, you've got the, you've got the press answer, which is oh, you know, wife, family, business, kids. And then you dig a little bit deeper and you've got the, you know, the, the, the real answer and the real values. And um, I know that you have the, um, the glass method, of course. <laughs> um, and, and I know we're going to discuss that in depth. Uh, yeah, stay tuned episode. for the glass method coming up um, in the next podcast. <laughs> absolutely. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to, 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 dig, to digging into that. Um, you know, uh, I think I read somewhere, was it a return to the, a, a, the return to a life well lived? I think is a is a great is a great way of um, kind of summarizing that. And I think to to wrap it up here, uh, Doctor G. You know, sure. If, if any if any viewer or, or, or listener um, themselves or or a loved one has any um, is struggling at all with anything related to addiction, mental health, then certainly head over to Darren Art Health. And all the contact details for Doctor G are going to be coming up on on the next slide. And yeah, just um, thank you again for such a, an interesting and informative chat. Well, I appreciate it, Alex. Let me leave our listeners with this thought. Relapse prevention is something that goes on your whole life. You're always trying to prevent a relapse. So it's not, sometimes people think it's someone who's newly sober has to be more careful. And sometimes they do. But we all know stories of people who've been 
sober for 30 years and suddenly relapse. To me, one of the most important things to do to you know ensure that you don't or have the odds going in your favor is the support system. You've got to have a very strong support system. That's why meetings, therapy, non-toxic friends, people that understand you, somewhere where you can go if you get in trouble is incredibly important. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Thank you Alex. Thank you. And uh, you. I look forward to talking about the glass <laughs> method because I'll say one thing. Method. It's not what yeah. people think it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Take, Take care, care, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.